Hey everyone, welcome back to The Athlete's Fine. Dr. Louie and Dr. Mani here, joined by a very special guest of ours and a very interesting guest, actually. This is uh, Dr. Jeffrey Earhart. He's an orthopedic trauma surgeon at Ortho, Illinois in Rockford, Illinois, which is somewhere 80 miles northwest of Chicago is how they sell it to get people out there, I think. Oh, God. And uh, <laughs> he's also an assistant professor at Rush University Medical Center, which is how we know each other. He was one of my attending surgeons when I was a fourth and fifth year orthopedic spine surgery resident. It's good to see you again. One buddy. of our favorite residents. Again. Yeah, and, also, right? and, and, I, and I know Dr. Earhart from even longer ago. We were actually college roommates back at Duke University. <laughs> so I have known Jeff for 24 years, more than half of my life. Ooh. And so uh, I found him as a very, very dear friend and close colleague. And he yeah. has grown to become, um, you know, a very, very well-known orthopedic trauma surgeon. Uh, uh, you know, he has amassed quite the following on Instagram and is known for his amazing educational content and has helped thousands of, of orthopedic trauma surgeons and orthopedic surgeons really across the world um, understand how to take care of fractures better and how to take uh, excellent care of these very challenging patients. So thanks for joining us today. We are uh, uh, very honored. It's a pleasure. Uh, two of my favorite people and uh... Yeah, the only person who loves you uh, more than me is my mother, Venu. So uh, she'll, be, she'll, be, she'll be so excited to hear about this. <laughs> uh, and we're talking about sort of a very unique topic today as well. You know, we, we spend a lot of our focus on the spine because that's sort of what Dr. Namani and I know best. But, you know, a lot of what we think about our, our bodies and sort of our axial balance, the spine and the pelvis are, are very interconnected. And from a biomechanic standpoint, from a functional standpoint, and, and Dr. Earhart is actually uh, focuses a lot of his treatments and, and his practice on pelvic injury. And so this certainly can happen in high energy um, mechanisms and, and those types of uh, injuries uh, where you can see it in, in these sporting events that are quite extreme. So you know, tell us a little about your practice and, and what you see from an injury standpoint. And, and yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, uh, pelvic trauma runs across such a broad spectrum of, of injury patterns and mechanisms and, and, uh, and patient types. And so, you know, you can see it anywhere from, you know, the, the young athlete uh, to the, um, you know, higher energy motor vehicle collision fall from height type patient all the way up to the geriatric fall from standing type patient. And, um, you know, what I find the most interesting about uh, treating pelvic injuries is that uh, it's it's truly as part of our core, it's kind of the focal point of so many uh, subspecialties in medicine. So, you know, whereas I approach it from the standpoint of stability, bones and ligaments and, and uh, you know, patient mobility and function, um, you know, it intersects uh, with uh, urologic function, GI function, uh, obstetrics and gynecology, vascular type uh, uh, pathology. There's just it's it's the it's the union of so many areas of medicine and to treat it effectively, um, you know, you have to be good at what you do and you have to be good at knowing what you don't know and um, working with uh, people with expertise in those particular areas. And you know, that's sort of uh, you know where you folks come in as as spine surgeons because, like you said, uh, the pelvic as part of our core is intimately related to the spine and they they function together um, as our core. And so. Um, it's not uncommon in a higher energy injury and, you know, certain um, devastating injury patterns where our practices uh, intersect. Yeah. And if we think about the the athletes that get these sorts of, of injuries, you know, these are not these are not tennis players that are getting these injuries. These are not golfers getting these injuries. So I'm thinking of, you know, um, uh, F1, you know, car racers, you know, horseback riders people who, are, who have the potential for some kind of really high energy mechanisms, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. From the, from the standpoint of the, um, the, the active patient, um, you know, injured doing what they love, it's, it's those higher risk, higher energy type uh, activities. Um, uh, people fall from height, you know, mountain climbers and, you know, wall climbers, mountain climbers and, you know, wall climbers, mountain climbers and stuff like that. It's, it's, um, it's a unique subset of the, uh, of the athletic patient. Yeah. So tell us this. So you, you, someone calls you or someone comes into your clinic and it's in a high mechanism injury, or right? well, you just mentioned the mountain climber or these high speed races. What is going through your head? What are you looking for? Like, how do you decide what to do for these patients? Right. Cause you've talked about a couple scenarios where one, maybe they don't need surgery, but 
for those that do it, it seems like a, a pretty intense maneuver. Yeah, uh, you know, when you're talking about a high energy injury, particularly involving the pelvis, um, your number one focus when you first meet this patient, which is usually in the hospital setting, is life over everything else. So um, these patients come in and, um, you know, I'm the least important person early on. So they're undergoing, you know, their ATLS assessment, um, airway breathing circulation. I mean, they're, that you're truly trying to um, identify the other aftermath of whatever it is they went through to have such a, a, a catastrophic injury to their uh, to their pelvis and or their spine. Um, so I'm, I'm taking the backseat to the, uh, the general trauma surgeons and the staff in the ER who are doing their primary assessment to make sure this patient is, is stable and in a position for me to come in and offer, you know, what I have to offer. So that's first and foremost. Um, you know, when it finally comes down to me, um, you know, sp spinal or sorry, not spinal <laughs> pelvic trauma uh, is it's one of the rare uh, things in orthopedics that that can truly kill you. So, you know, if you're fortunate enough to have undergone a significant injury like this and you make it to the point of a secondary survey and and my assessment, um, you know, then we're trying to find out is is the injury to your pelvis something that is going to kill you in in the coming hours or days um, because of bleeding, because of instability. Um, you know, under resuscitation, or is it something that's going to lead to permanent disability? So I'm trying to navigate between those two categories, uh, which can intersect, obviously. And when you talk of these, you know, really high mechanism of injuries, you know, just like you said, there are a lot of other structures that are really close by there. And so, um, you know, and, and as we think about the pelvis and the spine, I mean, these are where, you know, the, these two structures are joined together and literally connect your lower body to your upper body. And mm -hmm. so, these injuries can be associated with, with um, injuries to the nerves that can uh, control uh, with the nerves that go to your legs, that control your ability to walk, as well as the nerves that go to your uh, bowel and bladder. And so you can have uh, dysfunction of those nerves as well. And all of these things are important in the, uh, in the initial assessment of this patient once you've stabilized them and made sure that they're not going to uh, have a, a, something that's threatening their life. Absolutely. Um, you know, the, the, um, the, the vascular tree uh, within the, the true pelvis, um, the, the neural uh, anatomy, it's, it's quite complex. Um, and, uh, you know, this is not your, your, uh, your outpatient office neurologic exam where you're really fine tuning and looking for, um, you know, the, the most nitty gritty details. You're doing a rough rudimentary assessment of uh, both vascular stability and neurologic stability um, and, and trying to uh, determine if there's, you know, major deficit, number one, and then if there is, what's causing it, and can it be um, treated or reversed in the acute setting, um, let alone, um, you know, managed as part of the overall injury in the long-term setting. So um, it's it's not, it's it's a very rudimentary exam in some ways, but it's critical because you're really trying to take a, um, you know, a 30,000 foot view of a, a very complex structures and, and things um, that, that could be affected and have significant uh, ramifications. Yeah, and so we you've talked about like the large ramifications that are involved in this type of injury and then potentially surgery. I mean, so what are you telling these patients, especially these younger patients that have these significant injuries and then potentially need this significant surgery? And they're asking you, hey, Dr. Earhart, like I enjoy doing this in life. Can I do it again? When can I do it again? Yeah, it's it's a it's a really you know, it's one of the more difficult conversations you have to have in my line of work. Um there's a handful of ones that I I don't particularly enjoy because of the seriousness of them. And this is one of them. And what I try to do in the acute setting is different than what I try to do in the subacute setting. In the acute setting, you know, assuming that the patient is awake and alert and can participate in their exam and, and, uh, and assessment, um, you're just trying to reassure them that, uh, you know, that, you know, that they're, they're okay. And, you know, that there are things that you have to do to, um, you know, help their bodies get through the, the initial trauma that they're going through and that there's a lot more that may need to be done. And we'll discuss at the appropriate time, but, you know, reassure them that, uh, you know, that number one, that you're uh, a cape, that you're capable, that this is something that you're, you're qualified and able to take care of. Number two, um, that, uh, you know, it's going to require, um, you know, potentially a lot of additional work and, you know, you're going to, you're going to talk about those details later, but right now we're just trying to make sure that you're stable and okay. And we'll have those conversations at the appropriate time. It's pretty rare that people are asking nitty gritty questions in the trauma bay. Um, so if we fast forward to, um, you know, the, the day after or two days after where the patient perhaps is in a pelvic binder traction or some sort of, you know, preliminary stabilization type uh, device or, or intervention, you know, then it's time to really discuss 
the, the nitty gritty of what's going on. So at that point, you know, you, you try to be reassuring, you try to be encouraging. Um, the reality is that these are the types of injuries that that change someone's life forever. And yeah. that's a pretty devastating thing to say to somebody. Um, but in my in my experience and in you know in, in my philosophy on it, you don't do a patient uh, uh, any sort of service by slowly ripping off the band-aid. You need to set the stage for what is coming. Some of that depends on their age and pre and pre-injury function. Some of it is the injury they have. Some of it is what are their expectations for activity to get back to. They all factor in. And so um, I think it's really important to to set an appropriate tone early on, even though that tone is often not as happy and cheerful as you might want it to be. Um, I think it's better to prepare patients for the worst and hope for the best. And I'll often say that as part of my discussion um, that, you know, I'm, I'm here to take care of you, prepare you for what could come, but, you know, encourage them where there are reasons to be encouraged. You know, if there's no major neurologic uh, injury on their, on their initial assessment, you know, encourage them about that. You know, we don't find any, any reason to suspect that there's permanent neurologic injury. You have a long road ahead of you. It's going to take a lot of work, but I think that you can make a meaningful recovery and get back to the things you want to do. Um, and, and so, you know, again, it's tailored to the patient, but it's, again, I think most important to be honest and upfront with your patients. You're not their family and you're not their loved ones or support. You're the person with the experience and the, uh, the, the expertise and knowledge who has to really kind of guide them on what's going to be a long road ahead. And I think you've, uh, I've heard you say this before that, you know, uh, in the operating room, you know, uh, our job as surgeons is to do the best job that we can possibly do to put everything back in place to allow for recovery. But then that's, that's one day, right? And then mm -hmm. um, our job as surgeons, uh, uh, along with the patient's family and friends, turns more to cheerleader to really help them you know, uh, uh, you try to get them, uh, give them hope uh, to to work hard in their recovery because it's often a long process recovering from these very, very uh, difficult injuries. Absolutely. You know, um, you get one moment to shine in the operating room, sometimes two, depending on what's going on. Um, you know, you, you have you have your big moment in the OR to do your best to utilize on your experience and your training and your expertise, all the things you've worked for, you know, in training and in practice. Um, to provide the service that these patients need to recover. But that moment is over, you know, even in, with a long case, it's a blink of an eye in the grand scheme of things for that patient. And so, um, you know, we could have a, you know, a challenging six hour case in the operating room. And wow, was that a tough day? But that's a drop in the bucket compared to what your patients are going to be going through um, after the surgery is all over. So you're right. Um, you know, we train for years and years and years um, to be technicians, but you have to, you know, if you really want to take care of these patients effectively, you have to read patients, read their families, understand what their perspective is, where they're coming from and where they want to get back to and be their biggest advocate and be their cheerleaders and encourage them to put in the hard work that it takes to recover from an injury like this. Um, those types of, you know, a, a surgery in essence gets handed to them, um, but a functional recovery is something they work for. And without proper motivation, um, they won't be able to do it. And some of that is driven by um, their motivation. Some of it's driven by fear, you know, fear that if they work hard with their therapist, that they're going to screw up something from your surgery. So I spend a lot of time cheerleading. I spend a lot of time reassuring that, you know, what we did is, is, is rock solid and good. And you, you have my blessing to go forward and, and do the things that we've set out with your therapist for you to do and not, not rehab in fear. And I think that's a big part of it. Yeah, I mean, Dr. Hart, those are those are really fantastic words, and you know, and to sort of to bring some closure to this, I think it's important to remember that even though here at the Athlete Spine we always talk about you know professional athletes or other athletes who are going back to play because they've had this injury and then a surgery, there are some larger devastating injuries that are out there that dramatically change the way that their lives are going to be lived. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing, but it's just sort of a shift or a refocus. Mm -hmm. And in the spine world, it's, it's like the pelvic trauma world. Sometimes with these spinal cord injuries that we've talked about in previous episodes, we really don't know what recovery is going to look mm -hmm. like, but we can do what we can in the operating room. You know, we're in this relationship together and we, we were, we're sort of in this recovery together. And I think it's important to sort of bring this back, you know, full circle and remember things may be different, um, but we're in it together. and it's hard to predict the outcome sometimes and, and there's no algorithm to life like there may be no, absolutely. some other areas. Absolutely. No, you're absolutely right. And um, you know, you you can you can 
you can push for for you know the most optimal recovery, but um, you know it, it's not always possible. But I I don't find that ultimate that the ultimate uh, destination is really what um, completely dri drives happiness in my patient population. It's when they feel like I didn't abandon them, you know, post op day one, and and leave them on their own. If they feel like that they've um, they've gone through the process with you, not just as their technician, but as their physician, um, th there's much more acceptance of some of the downsides to some of these injuries. Um, you know, uh, um, a, a realization that you're, like you said, you know, life isn't bad now, it's just different. And um, I think that uh, that often gets lost in, in, in our line of work because we're so excited about the things that we do technically in the operating room. And we forget that we're we're also we're also physicians taking care of human beings on the worst day of their life, and uh, that's a that's a pretty awesome responsibility. Yeah, well, yeah thank you again well, for, for Dr. joining Dr. us Dr. today. Yeah. Thanks, yeah, thanks again for joining. It's really been a, a pleasure and honor to have you here with us. You know, um, and uh, you know, uh, we we these are the sorts of injuries that none of us ever hope to have to deal with, especially with a loved one or. Uh, are one of our favorite athletes, but, uh, you know, with uh, people like you at the helm, you know, we, the, the, these folks have the best chance of getting back to doing the activities they love. So thank you. Thank um, you. so until next time, I want to say thanks again to everyone. Be sure to like, and subscribe and follow us on Instagram, as well as uh, Dr. Earhart's very, very heavily subscribed Instagram page. Uh, until next time, see you later. Take care, everyone. All right. Take care, everyone. See you later.